I've had a ton of comments, ton of views on the old, old video that I made about the concealment shelf. It was very, very poor quality. It was one of the first videos that I ever did. It was in vertical format. I did it with my phone. I just did it because I had a lot of questions coming in from people. And I still do because I didn't answer enough questions. I didn't go into enough detail with the first one. So we're gonna redo it. And I'm gonna go step by step, showing you exactly what you need to build these things. This was one of my very first concealment shelves that I ever made. And you can see it's a nicer trim, things like that. Um, but I ended up changing this design to the one that we're going to talk about today and the one that the old video covered because there was more profit in this design. Yes, you could still make this other one, and I still did, but I had to charge more for it. This is where I could get my price point down to be competitive and sell a lot of these things. And then once we're done, I'm actually going to kind of go over some of my paperwork. I mean, look at this. That's what goes into marketing these things and selling these things in bulk. So let's get started. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is talk about all of the different parts that you need to build this. Um, in the old video, I kind of went along and told you what the parts were and the measurements as we went. I'm gonna do this up front, and I'm also going to put all of this in the description, the exact sizes, things like that. And I'm also gonna to talk to you a little bit about some different tips and tricks that I learned along the way of building these that, uh, that solved some of the issues that, that I ran into. Let's start with what exactly that we're gonna be making this out of. The, the top and the bottom are all gonna be made out of three quarter inch cabinet grade plywood. All right, so if you're buying this, if you're doing this to make multiples of these, get your graphing paper, lay it out, and you'll know exactly how many you can get out of one sheet of this three quarter inch plywood. Don't go cheap on your plywood. Get a nice cabinet grade plywood. That way the finish, if you decide to stain these, the finish is really gonna pop. Okay, so let's get started with the top. So the very top of this, the, the part that actually mounts to the wall, it's stationary. So that's kind of gonna be the top of your cabinet or your shelf. That is going to be this board here. This is a 10, by 22 by three quarters of an inch thick. Okay, you'll need one of those for this build. A part of this top will be your trim. And based on the sticker that's actually on the trim, this is 7 sixteenths by one and three eighths. So it does not have to be this exact profile. It just needs to have the flat edge and drop down. You do not need to get much thicker or much longer than that. But as long as it's 7 sixteenths by the 1 and 3 eighths, you're going to be perfectly fine. So for this build, you will actually need two pieces that are 12 inches long and one piece that is two foot long or 24 inches long. And I'm leaving these square edged for now. If you start off with just a bunch of these cut, then you can set your saw on one miter, cut all of that end. So that is the top. That's essentially all you need for the top. These will be held on with uh, one inch brad nails and glue. The bracket, is what I'm gonna call it. So anytime you hear me refer to bracket, this is the part that will actually mount to the wall, the top sits on, and you'll see as we go along how this works. And then these arms support and are attached to the top as well. So for this project, this bracket is two inch material, by 18 inches long. You need one of those and you will need two of these that are two inches by six inches long. Same material, 
same plywood as your top and your bottom. This is three quarter cabinet grade. That's all you need for your bracket. The bottom, now as you can see, this bottom I've already started to work up. In its raw state, before I started to do anything, it's 18 inches by seven and a half, and I'm gonna put all of this in the description by three quarter inch plywood. So whenever you go to mass produce these, you will make all of these cuts and any of these modifications that you do to it, just like I've already pre-drilled these to hold our hinges. You'll go ahead and you'll have a stack of these and you'll just do them all at once. And then you'll have a stack that's ready. What attaches to this is going to be your crown molding. Now the crown molding that I ended up using is a uh, 9 16 by three and a quarter. It really doesn't matter the profile on that. I'll show you this. But I found this is very inexpensive compared to what I showed you earlier. The really fancy crown you're looking at $20 a eight foot stick. Uh, this was a lot cheaper. I'm not sure what it's running now, but I think back when I was making these, it was like five or six bucks for a stick. Um, maybe even cheaper than that. So you will need two of these that are cut at 12 inches. One of these that are cut at 24 inches. Again, we will do our cuts as we go. The only other part that you're gonna need for the body of this, and we'll get into it as we're actually building this, is gonna be this little wooden block. Um, this wooden block is what our locking mechanism is going to sit on and take into account for the angle of the crown molding. Okay, the hinges. I don't know how I ended up with 5 8 hinges. It just seemed to be what worked the best. 5 8 hinges. I'll drop a link to all of this stuff in the description if I can find it. If not, then I will just tell you what type of a hinge it is, the brand, and uh, the, the size of it. The great thing about these hinges is they are adjustable, so in the end we will actually be fine-tuning these, that way it doesn't rub against the wall, anything like that. Speaking of rubbing against the wall, that was one of the big issues that we had with the original design. So what I ended up doing, remember this is the base, this is where the hinges go. On the very back, you can see, that's all I've done, ran this through a table saw at a 45 degree angle and left about three eighths. So I cut this pretty much in half. With the little bevel here on the edge, this sits against the wall. This is the part that raises. This will eliminate the issue of the back square part of it actually hitting the wall and making a mark. And as far as our pre-drilled holes for our hinges, I used a Craig cabinet hinge jig. Already has the Fossner bit, the correct size placed in here. You can use uh, just a standard Fossner bit if you would like. So the spacing for these two hinges are gonna be four inches to center from each side. And if you happen to use one of these, set the offset to three millimeters. I found that worked best. If not, if you're using a Fossner bit, this space here is the offset. That is three millimeters, or you can use an eighth, and that works out best. And I had a lot of questions about the locking mechanism. This is a child safety lock for kitchen cabinets. I'll throw the link into the description, um, but basically you can buy boxes of 24 of these for a decent price. Again, buying in bulk, you always get a better price. But what I have found is instead of buying these little cheap magnets, these little round black cheap magnets, 
These are about 75 cents a piece. It's a rare earth magnet. It's super, super slim, and they're a lot easier to conceal. So if people want to put them under something, uh, they can glue it to it, and they're just super, super strong. And it only takes this one to get through all of this material, whereas if you buy these little cheap black magnets, it may take three or four, and they may have to stack them up inside of a box. One of these rare earth magnets, and it only increases your cost by about 50 cents, so well worth it. One of the most expensive parts of the whole build is the damper or the strut. Now, in the original video, I actually used, and in my original design for this, I actually used a 50N gas strut. If you use a 100N, that's too much pressure, it's gonna be pushing down too hard. So the gas strut is actually forced down. This is a 10N damper, but what this does, instead of forced down, it actually lets it drop a little slower. You have a controlled drop versus the forced drop. I found that these are a lot better. It makes for a lot nicer feel, a lot nicer look. They are a bit more expensive though. I think that the, the gas struts, I think they're around $5 a piece and these are around $9 um, a piece. You may be able to find them cheaper, but this is the most expensive part of this whole build. And that's really about it. What you see here is basically everything that we need. It is everything we need, you know, besides glue, air nail, or things like that, um, to put this thing together. So let's actually put this together, go through some different things uh, as we're doing this. And if I run into any little tips and tricks for speeding the process up, I'll talk about that as we go, because there are several. Just, Just like staining all of this material, it's actually easier if you stain this before, even though you will be going back and filling in some nail holes, things like that as you go. It took me an hour and five minutes to make one of these whenever I was doing this every day. And the most time consuming part of the whole process was staining or painting these things. So if you can get that done before, then you can actually go back and just do some touch up staining as you go. Also, when you're staining a lot of parts, I took some of my profit from this bought one of those Graco airless sprayers, uh, super awesome by the way, and it knocked out a ton of time as well. Okay, so for assembly of this top, I told you I'm gonna go through some, uh, just some little tricks and things like that that I learned along the way. Anytime you're working with a piece that you need to stand on edge, like we're gonna be doing to put this tram on, it's kind of hard to work with. So this little trick that I came up with is just taking a little angle bracket and then you can either mount it, you know, I actually had to mount it at a workstation for this, to your table, or you can put a clamp on it. And this will actually give you something to hold this into place. And then, let's say if you're just working on the top or whatever, you can put another little clamp there just to hold this while you're working, getting everything lined up. So now that we have this where we can actually work on it, I'm going to first start off by cutting this top trim piece, which is gonna be this. And you wanna look at the grain of the wood, make sure to put your best grain on top because that's what's gonna be seen. Okay, so let's start off by cutting the 45 for the top. What I always like to do is put 145 on one end, set my station up close to my miter saw, that way, I could line my 45 up with my edge and then mark where I need my next one. So with the first 45 cut, I can actually line it up onto my top, go across and mark exactly where I need my next 45. Makes great for precision fitting. And now I'm gonna make that cut. So I zoomed in here a little bit closer, get a better look at what's going on. We have our top and we have our top trim with both 45s. So I'm gonna glue this up. And we will make sure that our edges are lined up perfectly. And we'll start with one edge and we'll put a one inch finish nail in. 
and then work our way down. Now that the top is attached, let's go ahead and put our 45s on our two side pieces. Okay, so with our top attached, now we can line up our sides. And I like to line it all up and then mark exactly where I need to make my 90, just a, a flat cut. And again, station set up right behind you, so you can make that quickly. And just like we did for our front. And the tighter the joints that you can make, the less that you're gonna have to do as far as uh, filling in any voids or anything like that. And we will flip it over. Just lining it up. Now, if you're going to be staining any of these, clean up any excess glue as you go. Glue on plywood or really any other type of wood will actually leave a mark and does not accept stain. All right, so now that the top is done, let's move on to the bottom. So when you go to do your bottom, and you already have the hose pre-drilled and the back on, you know that this will be the back of your piece. So all of this crown will actually be going on the front and be facing up, because this is making our compartment, okay? So for this crown, you'll notice that one side is longer or has a wider, flat edge than the other. The longest flat edge, which is this one, will be the side. So let's get these cut. First edge of the crown is cut. Let's go ahead and get it put on. So with the inside, remember this is the inside of the box. First edge of the crown is cut. Let's go. and then get your measurement for your second corner. Both angles are cut. And you can put as many nails in as you're comfortable with. And let's do the sides. Now to speed these up, I'm just going to go ahead and cut both of these sides where they'll mate with these, and then we'll put those on. Quick tip, whenever you're marking the crown sides, mark it to where this bevel, the bevel that we put on to the back uh, to keep it from hitting the wall, make sure that this is marked where that bevel starts. Because if you brought it all the way out to the edge of this board, then you're kind of defeating the purpose of this bevel. And now we'll attach the side pieces. And now we have our bottom. Now you can just sand the edges of this up um, one of these blocks get into these corners pretty nice if everything didn't mate up exactly, but Kiddos are on dirt bikes, so I can't film You may need a couple kiddos So now before we actually go to put these together, let's make sure that our bottom and our top fit Looks like it fits great starting to come together. Now let's build this back brace, that's what I'm gonna call it. It actually goes on the inside of this, but basically it's all we're doing is putting this together. Now, if you've noticed in this back plate, 
of the back brace, there is already four holes drilled. Whenever I was mass producing these, I actually made a jig that you could snap onto the board and show you exactly where you needed your holes. Jigs are awesome. Make a jig if you're planning on making more than, more than one of these. These first two holes, the two holes at the top, those are going to be to mate with the arms. Okay, so we're going to put a couple screws through those. These next two, they are 16 inches apart from each other, from one end to the other. The reason for this is this is what's going to be holding all of this up. This is what's going to be mounted to the wall. Since studs are typically 16 inches apart inside of a house, I made sure to make these 16 inches apart. That way, whenever the customer gets it, the screws are already with it and they can uh, easily mount this. this bracket. I'm gonna put a little bit of glue. And then I'm actually going to nail it. Even though I'm gonna put screws in there, this allows me to um, apply the screws a little easier whenever I go to force. So I'm just gonna drop a nail in here. Just kind of help hold it into place. Same thing for the other side. And even though these two are pre-drilled, I'm going to go ahead and pre-drill further in, keep him from splitting the material. Kids, I swear, to go on. So this is the bracket that we just made. Once we see that it fits, we can go ahead and glue this up and nail it. Try to leave equal spacing on the overhang of the top on both sides. And the best way to apply the side nails to your arms, we know that they go six inches in plus this three quarter. We can see from the back where it connects. It's just to use a square. And there we have it. Our bracket is now attached to our lid. what she's looking like so far getting there now you see the extra space that's what we want we don't want because if we have to adjust this lid with the hinge we don't want to have to we have to pull it back we don't want it to, to hit so whenever I designed this particular one I made sure that we had plenty of hangover on all edges for uh, any type of adjustments that we had to do now we'll go ahead and screw our hinges into place. I use three quarter inch screws and then just anything for a straight edge. And I'm going to align this bottom bracket to where it's square with the edges of the base. And on these hinges, there's little teeth where it's actually designed for a cabinet it's just sit on. We're just going to align that with those and then drop in a couple more three quarter screws. Now that that is attached, we will look and see what kind of adjustments that we may need to make. And you can tell right away by looking at the underneath on the inside which hinge needs to go in or out, front or back. And we'll just make those fine tune adjustments now. And this is what we're looking at now.
So this is where those little blocks I was telling you about are going to come in handy. This is a 60 degree angle on a block that is, I think it's three quarters of an inch. Yes, three quarters of an inch wide. Okay, so the widest point is three quarters, 60 degree angle. And this is three quarter inch material and it is two and a half inches wide. The reason why this is a little wider than our other stock was it has to be able to fit this locking mechanism. So we'll get that installed. The angle portion will be against the crown and you want it to where it is flat in the center. I'm just gonna hold this in. You could also use CA glue if you would like, um, just to kind of help hold that in. I like to put a couple of nails in this. That glue will dry nicely. Give you a little closer look. And that is what we're looking at. And again, this is just a bracket to hold a part of our locking mechanism. It has 3M stick tape on the bottom, and we can use that to start with, but we'll go ahead and put a couple of screws in that as well. So when you get these, the lip will kind of look like this. The lip goes down because that's what we want our latch to connect to. And we're going to put this edge where it is, even with the top of this block. So this little piece is actually for lining up the two locking mechanisms. It slides down into your piece that's already there. And then it will lock this way. Remember, it is locked right now. And you can take off this sticker, set it in there, and we will actually shut our hinge or shut the top, press down. And we'll separate this. That part that fell off was the attachment. And now they are perfectly lined up. So now that's all we'll do is attach these two pieces, that way they don't move. These little screws actually came with the locks. And I have pre-drilled these with a 1 16th bit. Okay, now if we would like, we can try out the locking mechanism. Just like any other magnet, there is a front and back for polarity. Flip it over, it will not work. So let's try it out. Let's see if she locks. That is a lock. So for the time being, I'm gonna go ahead and just shut this. We know that the locking mechanism works. Now we need to install the gas damper. Installing these dampers or struts, whichever you decide to use, is a pain in the butt trying to do it, you know, just on a work surface. So I actually built this. It's all it is is crap two by fours, but it's something that I can mount this to just like if it was on a wall. And I can also make sure that once I get it in place, everything is going to open and close as it should. That way that uh, the customer doesn't get it, they mount it to their wall and the back digs into their wall. So let's get this mounted and put this damper on. So what I like to do with these dampers is actually bring them all the way out and then you'll notice there's a little snap here that a screwdriver can fit under that will release this part. And the same thing on this end. So I'm gonna mount the round part of this damper back here towards the edge, as close to the top as I can get it without this trim being in the way. Then the bottom part is actually gonna be connected down onto our trim on the inside. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this off and get that mounted. Okay, so this is where we're at now. Once you get your damper or your strut, whichever you decide to use, installed, now we can give it a try. So we're just going to unlock that so it will actually lock. And she locks. So again, our magnet, 
with a little bit of weight inside of here, it drops down. That is the difference between the strut, which is a very forceful push, versus a little bit more of the controlled drop. So while it's still mounted here, this is the perfect time to go ahead and finish this thing off. So go ahead and fill in all these nail holes with wood putty, sand it, stain it, whatever you're gonna do, put a finish on it. Let it dry sitting like this, where you can get up underneath of it, where you can reach it. Make all of your final adjustments from the back. Adjust your hinges in and out so that the back does not rub the wall whenever it drops. The only thing left to do for this is going to be to insert our foam. So the foam that we actually use for the inside of this is called Kaizen foam, okay? It comes in a two by four sheet like this. This is the best way that I've found to get the most for your money because you can actually just take this and slice it this way and have enough in one sheet for several different shelves. So again, a uh, tip for that is to heat your knife whenever you're making your cuts. So this is one that I already had pre-cut to fit a couple of pistols and a couple of mags. If you'll notice with this piece, you can also create a jig for this. I had a jig made out of plywood that I would lay onto my foam, heat the knife, and make my cuts for this. You have to make a cut for your locking mechanism. You need to make this 60 degree angle here to match up to your trim. And this piece could actually, I just took this out of another one, and it could actually stand to be a little wider. You want it the same width as the inside of your two arms. Also, you need to make sure that it's not so deep that it catches in underneath of these hinges. These hinges need to close. And you can see I've actually heated a knife and taken a little divot out of each end here. And it will need to be centered so this locking mechanism can drop into the center of that. And then it locks. We move our magnet over the lock. And you get this low drop down. So that's about it, guys. So I hope that this video is a little bit better than the last one. Again, these things are, are really not hard at all to make. It just takes a little bit of time. And then once you get that down, like I said, I had this down to about an hour and five minutes. So that was, you know, that was building pretty fast. So just depending on what type of stain, what type of finish that you choose to use. And I actually sold a lot of these just as they are. Let the customer put their own stain on. Of course, the nail holes will be filled in, things like that. But let the customer put their own stain on. Uh, let the customer paint it, decorate it however that they would like. So let's take a look at that notebook I was telling you about. So the notebook, everyone needs to have a notebook with all of these scribbles and drawings and all of that on there. Almost everything that I do is on graphing paper. But this is more than just the design because you already have the design. This is going to be everything from the entire cost of this, including waste factor. How much did this thing cost total to make? It has my time. I actually timed myself with each different section. You know, how long that it took with sanding, like cutting crown with sanding took nine minutes. The lock installation took five minutes. Stain, 20 minutes. 20 minutes was my bottleneck whenever I was first starting out. So like I said, I bought that Graco sprayer. Doing things like this allows you to find your bottleneck. What's causing things to slow down Time is money whenever you're mass producing items. It also includes different places to sell, like Etsy, what their fees are, the transaction fee, the payment fee, the processing fee. So at $250 on Etsy, this thing is gonna cost $20.45 just in Etsy fees. Take into account everything because those things are coming from your profit margin. Also, the uh, has packaging. Um, I bought some boxes from Uline and I found them cheaper on Amazon. Um, the size of the box, we discussed that earlier, you know, that all goes into your free shipping. Um, or even better yet, sell local, hand deliver. But write down everything that you find out onto this piece of paper, okay? That way you can look back, reflect on it, even like me, it's been over a year since I've made one of these, but I know everything about it because I kept this notebook. 
I have um, the foam, how much it costs. Now, again, these are prices from a year ago, so they're going to be different. A 24 by 48 sheet of this Kaizen foam from Fast Cap was $13.19. If I purchased it in bulk, it was even cheaper. My competition, you know, what was the competition selling for at the time? Could I compete with them? Yes, I could. And then what it would cost me to build 10 units, to build eight units, to build 16 units, to build 24 units, and to build 32 units. I actually have everything down, you know, how many sticks of crown, how many sheets of plywood, so you can actually come up with the most for your money. So you buy one sheet of plywood, how many units can I make with that one sheet? Counting my tops, my bottoms, you know, the brackets, things like that. Get all the way down to the screws, all right? Do not leave anything on the table. Oftentimes you do this step before you even start to build because if you can't make a profit, don't waste your time on building. Again, when you first do this project, it is gonna take you longer than an hour and five minutes to build one. I've been building them for a long time. The first one of anything that you build will take the longest. After that, if you keep good notes, everything goes quicker. So, hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helps. I hope it's a little bit better than the last one. Go out guys, make these, make them, sell them. Good luck with it. Change up the, uh, the trim if you want. Just remember, anytime you change the crown molding width or the spring angle, it also changes the size of the top that you need. So just keep that in mind, but get creative with this. Go out and sell it, make some money. Until next time guys, go out there and make that money and enjoy it. Have fun doing this, all right? So, see ya.